How to construct a truth table to show whether an argument is valid or invalid. The argument we'll use is expressed here at the top. This is in standard form. We've got three premises and the turnstile introduces the conclusion. And so just like for any table, we take the information that we're going to analyze, put it across the top of the table. Now I like to separate the premises and the conclusion with a solid line here. And then up at the front, we put the guide columns. Of course, the guide columns are just a list of all the sentences, sentence letters that show up, in this case, in the argument. Well, there's only two in here, so there are R and S. And when we have two sentence letters, how many rows are we going to have to worry about? And of course, the answer is four because there are four combinations of true and false that you have to worry about when you have two sentence letters. The easy way to generate these is as I'm doing here. True, false, true, false in the first column. True, true, false, false in the second column. We have two trues at the top, two falses at the bottom, and the combinations in the middle. Okay. Now, the only purpose of the guide columns is to tell us what goes underneath each case of R and S. If we're going to be really thorough about things, the next step will be very boring but important, and that is to rewrite the guide columns underneath every sentence letter. So true, false, true, false, true, false, true, false, true, false, true, false, and true, false, true, false. Now let's do the same thing for S. Two trues, two falses. Two trues, two falses, two trues, two falses. And at this point, we're really done with the guide columns. That is their only job. Now the truth is, once you've done a number of tables, there are some shortcuts that you could take, but for this one, we should probably minimize the shortcuts. Now, the next step is something I probably wouldn't do for such a simple table, but it doesn't hurt to illustrate the concept, and that is I like to number all the connectives so that I know exactly what order I'm working in. We always do main connectives last, and so for this formula, I would number one, two, and then the ampersand itself would be three. So, our first, once we have them numbered, we just start doing the applying the rules, and we see that we have a tilde. Tildes, of course, are just opposite value. So true, false, true, false is going to turn into what? False, true, false, true. Now you never use a column more than once, so now that we've used this, we can cross it off. And now we work on the tilde in front of the S. And that's the same thing. True, true, false, false is turning into false, false, true, true. Cross off what we just used. And now we have an ampersand. What's the rule for the ampersand? The rule officially says you get a true output if and only if both of the inputs are true. So false ampersand false, that would be false. True and false, false, false and true, false, true and true, ah, that would be a true one. Cross off what we just used. And then, since the ampersand was the main connective for the formula, let us circle it. This is the result for the first premise. All right, second premise, is it, will it be the tilde or the wedge first? Main connectives last, so it's going to be tilde first and then the wedge. Okay, so once again, another exciting tilde. False, true, false, true. False, true, false, true. Cross off what we just used. Then the wedge. The rule for the wedge says you get a true output if at least one of the inputs is true. So false wedge true, true. True wedge true. True. False wedge false. That's false. 
and true wedge false is true. Circle the wedge because that is the main connective. You know, I wouldn't really have to cross off these others because I'm not paying any attention to them anymore, but it doesn't hurt. And then finally we get to tilde tilde, S-R-O-R. What do we know about two tildes? They're going to cancel each other out. Now, if you were really numbering this officially, the main connective is this first tilde. Basically, you always start within parentheses, so if you were really going to do this thoroughly, you'd do the arrow first, and then you would do this tilde, and then you'd do the tilde on the outside. But we know two tildes right together are going to cancel each other out, so it's kind of just silly to pay attention to that. All we have to do is the arrow. What is the rule for the arrow? Yes, the arrow is very peculiar. The rule says that it's a true output, except in the case of T arrow F. That's the only time that an arrow comes out to be false. All right, uh, true arrow true is true. True arrow false, that is the false case we just mentioned. False arrow true is true, and false arrow false is true. Circle that result, cross out the others so they don't confuse us, and finally R. Well, this is just too easy. There are no connectives. The guide column itself is the result for the formula. We have just finished the construction of the truth table. Um, it was not exciting, but it is complete, and here is the cool thing we can read right off of this result whether this argument is valid or invalid. How do you do that? Well, in fact, this is where the definition of validity is supposed to come in so useful. The definition says an argument is valid if and only if, and feel free to join in if you'd like, if the premises are true, then the conclusion must be true. I think it deserves an exclamation point, don't you? So how do you use the definition of validity to determine if an argument is valid or invalid? It really couldn't be easier. What we're going to do is examine each row of the table. Each row is an assessment or an interpretation of the argument based on the input values. And what we're looking for is a violation of the definition of validity. If you check each row, notice what you discover on the fourth row. The fourth row, whoops, I'm not doing that. That was weird. On the fourth row, got to grab the pencil, on the fourth row, all the premises are true, but the conclusion, true, 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 the conclusion is false. The definition says if the premises are true, then the conclusion must be true. So this row represents, this row demonstrates that this argument does not satisfy the definition of validity because it's possible for the premises to all be true and yet the conclusion to be false. If you find such a row, you should circle it. The row is called a counterexample. A counterexample just is a case where premises are true and conclusion are false. And on a table, we can define it this way. It's a row on which all premises are true and conclusion is false. All premises are true, and conclusion is false. All right, come on. I can write the whole thing. There we go. This is the definition of a counterexample for the table. And when you are checking an argument to see if it's valid or invalid, this is all that you need to look for. I know it almost seems too simple, doesn't it? 
Now a quick comment about this TROF. When we were working on the conditional, we pointed out that the only time that a conditional is false is when you have TROF. We also know that the definition of validity is a conditional. The only time that you can make this conditional false is when you make the antecedent true and you make the consequent false. In other words, all premise is true and conclusion false. This is no coincidence. Validity is about preserving truth. When you go from truth to falsity, you have violated validity. This argument goes from truth to falsity. Or, not, or at least it's possible for it to do that. Notice that the other rows don't present a problem, but for an argument, if the premises are true, then the conclusion has to be true. All right, what we should do is another couple of examples. This argument has four premises and a conclusion, and we've constructed the table. What's the answer? Is this argument valid or invalid? Now, of course, you might notice, hey, on the first row, we have all the premises true and the conclusion true. It turns out this doesn't interest us. Notice on the third row, we have got all the premises true and the conclusion false. That's a counterexample. If you have a counterexample, then the argument is invalid every single time. So I can't overemphasize. All you're looking for is a counterexample. If you find it, the argument's invalid. But if you don't find a counterexample, the argument's valid. So what about this row up here? Well, in this case, it's possible for the premises to be true and the conclusion to be true. But the definition says, if the premises are true, the conclusion has to be true. And that's why this row is a problem. All right, well, let's look at another example. Looking at this, is this valid or invalid? Well, notice the second row is all premises false and conclusion true. Does that interest us? And the answer is no, it does not. The only thing that we're interested in is a counterexample. All premises false and conclusion true? We don't care about that. We do find on the third row that all the premises are, the are true and the conclusion is true, but that's not especially interesting either. What's interesting is that there's no counterexample. Because there's no counterexample, we say it's valid. And really, what's the reason that this argument is valid? It's not because of row three. It's valid because there is no, not not, but no. It's valid because there's no counterexample. I'm not going to fit this on here, am I? Oh, yeah, there it is. Okay. Count. All right, uh, let's do another example. So this time we've got an eight row example. I had to rearrange things to get it to fit on here. But we're looking for this very same thing. Three premises, one conclusion. Do you find a counterexample? And the answer is yes, you do. When you look at the fifth row, you see that all the premises are true and the conclusion is false. Always circle the counterexample. If you find a counterexample, then the argument's invalid. None of the other rows interest us. We are looking for violations of the definition of validity, and that's what we found. One more example. In this example, you'll notice that we have several counterexamples. We have a counterexample on row one, and then there's another one on row five, and yet another one on row seven. So you can have lots of counterexamples. The only point I want to make here is that doesn't necessarily make the argument more invalid. Basically, you can, you're either valid or invalid. Uh, validity doesn't generally come in degrees. All right, for this example, we are back to a four-row argument, 
and is this one valid or invalid? Obviously your first thought is, wait, we don't have a conclusion. However, what is a counterexample? A row on which all the premises are true and the conclusion is false. Since there's no row where all the premises are true, this argument will be valid. In this particular case, it doesn't matter what the conclusion is, the argument would be valid. Notice if you look at premise 1 and premise 2 in particular, notice that they're exact opposites of each other. We've seen this doing proofs. It is as though premise 1 is B and premise 2 is tilde B. Premise 1 and premise 2 are contradicting each other. And what follows from a contradiction? Absolutely anything. If you were doing a proof, it wouldn't matter what your conclusion is. If your conclusion was D, well, you would just say, I'm going to make a box for tilde in or tilde out, and then you would assume the opposite as a provisional assumption, and then you would just insert the contradiction. 1, 2, ampersand in, and you're done. Justification here, of course, would be 3 through 4, tilde out. So from a contradiction, anything follows, and we're seeing that illustrated on the table. So in some cases, you don't have to have information about the conclusion to know whether or not the argument is valid or invalid. And this time, we'll go the other direction. Is there enough information on this table to say if this argument's valid or invalid? And the answer is definitely yes. A counterexample is all premises true and conclusion false. Your conclusion in this case is a tautology. Tautologies are always true, and so any argument that has a tautology as its conclusion is going to be valid. In fact, a tautology is a self-proving formula. Here's one example of a tautology, P or O P. If pigs can fly, then pigs can fly. If I like purple, then I like purple. Well, a tautology can be proved even if there are no premises. So let's say you were going to do this argument, and on line one you have nothing because you have no premises. Nonetheless, you could finish this proof. You could say, well, I will make a box for arrow in. I'd put P at the top and P at the bottom. If I can get from here to there, I'm done. Well, this is just too easy, right? To get from P to P, I'm just going to borrow my repetition shortcut rule and say 1 R, and now I'm done. Every, every tautology can prove itself in a similar way. Just to be clear, Sometimes you don't have enough information to give an answer. In this case, is there a counterexample? Well, on the second row you have all premises true, so you would really need to know what the value of the conclusion is in this case. So in this particular situation, there's not enough information. Well, I think that's about all I have to say about constructing truth tables for validity. At least uh, that's the basic information. If you find a counterexample, it's invalid. If you don't, it's valid.